got the word, so we can start. So welcome everybody. Um, this is going to be an informal chat about 30 years of my involvement with beginnings of Aboriginal theatre in Australia. Talking about the productions and the support and how the productions began and where they toured to. Who cared about them? Who financially supported them, which is really interesting when you look back. And why I thought it was very it was a very important part of the programming that I've done up over the last 30 years. First of all, some history. It's about white theatre and how that first began in Australia because I go as Wesley's already pointed out, I can go back quite a long way. <laughs> <laughs> so about 60 or more years ago, when I got through drama school, the only theatre that was available in Australia was the commercial circuits down at Carroll and J.C. Williamson's. And uh, you used to go to England. That was, where, that was where your career would start and a lot of people, of course, Australians stayed there. I, I, I went to England and I worked in weekly rep, but I came back to Australia and I got a job with J.C. Williamson's. And I always enjoy telling this story because it took 18 months to tour around Australia and New Zealand. We did eight shows a week for six months in Melbourne, eight shows a week for six months in Sydney, and then we went to Adelaide, Perth, Brisbane, and over to New Zealand. And of course, what we were touring was a copy of what was currently on in the West End or Broadway, with stars from those countries and the Australians and got the supporting parts. So that was what you look forward to until Nabbit Coon set up the Australian Elizabethan Theatre Trust. And the whole idea was to create an Australian theatre. But there were very few directors or people qualified, so they brought out Hugh Hunt, an Englishman, who of course brought Sir Rafe Richardson, Dame Sybil Thorndike, yeah. and presented very good quality work, but again, English work. I mean, I, I had a part with uh, Margaret Rutherford in The Happiest Days of Your Life, you know. I mean, they were bringing out shows that had been very successful overseas. But finally, the Elizabethan Theatre Trust set up a national opera company and a national ballet company, but they didn't, and they had Robin Lovejoy um, touring Australia with what was called the Trust Players. But when they set up the theatre companies, they set them up individually in the States rather than a national, one national company. And that's why we have what you saw at the previous um, forum the Queensland Theatre Company, the Sydney Theatre Company, the Melbourne Theatre Company, they were all doing their own thing. Anyway, I managed to eke out a living for 30 years, but one day I decided I'd like to be a producer. And having worked for the Elizabethan Theatre Trust, I thought I'll go and I'll volunteer. So I walked off the street and I told them I wanted to learn about budgets and contracts. So I went every day for five months, and I hadn't learned anything about budgets and contracts. <laughs> I was making artistic decisions, because they'd say, what do you think of this, or what do you think of that? So I said, I can't come anymore, and they said, why not? And I said, well, I've got two children to support, and I can't really keep coming for nothing. But they got so used to me, <laughs> <laughs> pain in the neck I probably was, that John Frost had actually been working there as the coordinator, you know John Frost from uh, commercial management, he'd been working there as a co coordinator and he left. And of course they couldn't think of anybody else, so they gave me the job. They said, will you come back and we'll pay you? So it was very good training because 
I learned about commercial theatre because they were bringing big companies from China, uh, Italy, but they weren't doing, they were doing very limited Australian work. So within a few months, I'd set up an Australian content department. And within a couple of years, the Australian Council, who was happy to have me there, had given me the Australian content department the money that the Trust had previously been receiving from them. So everybody would come to sit in my office because <laughs> they knew me from being a performer. Meryl Tankard, I gave her her first job back in Australia as a choreographer. She'd come and cry in my office and say, nobody loves me, why can't I get my show on? And of course Brian Siren and Bobby Merritt came and they'd sit there and they'd say, got to do another production of The Cake Man. Well, I hadn't seen the first production of The Cake Man. It had originally been workshop in April 1975 by the Black Theatre of Redfern with Brian Siren and Justine Saunders in it. And then a full production had been given at the Bondi Pavilion in 1977 with George Ogilvy as director. Could we do it again? Well, I didn't know how, but it just so happened that the trust was a very good place to be positioned because people from overseas would contact the trust for Australian work. And there was a, going to be a festival in Denver, Colorado, a World Theatre Festival. What did the trust suggest should go? Well, they suggested an Australian musical that had just gone on, a small Australian musical. I said, no, no, that's too expensive. Then said, the cake man. <laughs> well, I didn't quite know what I was in for, but, but they said yes. So, of course, then we had to get it on. So we decided that we'd do the production and we'd have showcase it before it went overseas. Obviously, it had to have a showcase. The Trust actually sent out 2,000 letters seeking tax deductibility donations from big Australian companies and American firms operating in Australia, and they got one donation. It was from the Common Commercial Banking Company of Sydney. So the tour was finally financed by $15,000 from the Aboriginal Arts Board of the Australia Council, 15,000 from Foreign Affairs, 6,000 from the Premier's Department of New South Wales and 20,000 from the Trust itself. Well, the showcase was to have three performances and we sent out all the invitations, but nobody RSVP. So I started to learn things. It didn't mean that people weren't coming, just that they didn't RSVP. <laughs> I remember that I stood in the foyer and thought, nobody's going, this is not going to be an audience. But suddenly, at 10 to 8, everybody arrived, and there was a queue from the Parade Theatre, which is the old Parade Theatre out of Kensington outside and onto the main road and the theatre filled and it was a wonderful send a wonderful send off because um, politicians came in, a lot of Aboriginal people came to see their mates in the show and off they went to Denver, Colorado where they played eight performances so when they came back I thought well I, I better get it around Australia so I I sent it to, to Melbourne and to Brisbane. I don't remember how I got the money, but at least it got there. So it was, I thought to myself, there must be other people writing shows or presenting Aboriginal work. I must find out where they are. So I heard about a writer called Jack Davis in Perth. And I heard that he had a director working with him called Andrew Ross who at that time 
was in charge of the um, theatre and education department at the uh, WA Theatre Company. I think it was called the National Theatre Company in those days. And so I contacted Andrew and he'd, he'd already done a play called Colour, which was one of Jack's early plays. And I learned that Jack had been an activist. He'd, um, he'd always written poetry, but he'd worked a, a great deal at, out of um, properties and farms in WA. But he decided that he wasn't getting anywhere by standing up and arguing. It was better to write, write it down and use the theatre as his forum for making change. And so Andrew said to me, we're, we're going to do a Jack's next play called The Dreamers. Oh, I forgot, I'm supposed to put on the pictures. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Look, there was the cake man, and that was, that was it, um, going to Denver, Colorado. And um, that was Little Pumpkin Head in the middle. And there's Justine Saunders, who used to complain in those days that she was always asked to be bare-breasted. And, and um, she said, I, I read an, a newspaper article that I've got from back in those days, and she said, I'm sick of being bare-breasted. If I have to take my top off from now on, they're going to have to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's Ethel Crompton. And here comes Brad Siren and, oh, sorry, and... Um, now I've jumped onto the dreamers, and that, that was the, the poster of the dreamers. So I'll tell you how we got to the dreamers. Andrew um, said, we're, we're, we're doing this production, and it was for the Festival of Perth season in 1983. And Andrew directed, Ernie Dingo did the choreography, which surprised me, I'd forgotten that. <laughs> and, and Ted Wilkes and Richard Wally did the music, and the cast had Jack Davis himself, Ernie, Lynette Narkel and Maxine Narkel and John Moore. And the Trust picked it up and toured it for 17 weeks. That was, a, in those days, that was a terrific tour to manage to get around Australia. We did another season in Perth. We did a West Australian country tour. It went to the Alexander Theatre in Melbourne. And would you believe the Ensemble Theatre, which is at North Sydney, in New South Wales, in Sydney, um, was doing at that time programs at the Opera House. So we talked them into putting the Dreamers into their Opera House season. And I, and I always remember, this is one of the very first things I learned, I went to a school's matinee of, and sat with all the kids. And they laughed and laughed at all the humour. And when I'd gone with adult audiences, only the Aboriginal people had laughed. The white people didn't know when to or whether they were allowed to or were nervous. But the kids loved it. They thought it was the funniest thing and they just naturally um, enjoyed the humour. And uh, that follows through the whole sort of history of my work. It was, it was really interesting. So the, the Opera House season was a great success. And we also did, we went to Tasmania with it and did Hobart, Burnie and Launceston. So Andrew Ross said to me, Wendy, The Dreamers is the second part of a trilogy. You've got to commission Jack to write the first part. <laughs> well, it was to be no sugar. <coughs> so I, I can't remember where I found the money, but I got enough money to commission Jack and to pay Jack and Andrew for six months. And I remember I bought them a second-hand typewriter. And they used to, used to spend their days typing away. And I thought, well, if Jack's going to be writing, he can do a children's play at the same time. <laughs> and so I said, I said to him, will you write a children's play? And he said, he, he said to me afterwards, I'm never going to write two plays at the one time. But he wrote Honey Spot. So we, we, had, no, we had Honey Spot, which deals with, as you probably know, the twin issues of conservation and racism, as well as No Sugar, which was an epic drama 
on the plight of Aborigines during the Depression years. So no sugar was workshopped in Perth in 1984 and it premiered at the Festival of Perth in 85. Now at that particular time, a representative of the Van Cooper World Festival visited Australia and of course came to the Elizabethan Theatre Trust to discuss what she should choose to represent Australia at the festival, her festival in 1986. She visited Adelaide, Melbourne and Brisbane. And she came back to the Trust and she said, I can't see anything that I want to represent Australia. And I said, well, no sugar's on in Perth. Could you get there? And to give her a due, she changed her, she was supposed to fly out the next day to Hong Kong. She changed all her bookings. She flew to Perth. She saw no sugar in this funny little space that it was performing in, where you had to sort of stand like that. I mean, I could hardly see, but um, <laughs> you had to stand like that because it was very limited space. But she saw it and she said, that's what I want to represent Australia. Well, I had a year to find the money. I had to find $100,000. I didn't know how I was going to get the money. West WA gave me 50000 <laughs> But the people in New South Wales who were putting on a, an Australian exhibition and had a trade centre said, we're not sending a bloody corroboree, you're not getting a penny. And I was so furious, I thought, I will, I'll find it. And I actually I did, I got the 100,000 and we re-rehearsed the show and it was the most exciting experience because here was a, a, a fam, almost like a family, because the artists in the show, Jack and, um, and uh, Jack's two elderly sisters, and um, Ernie, Richard Wally again, um, they, they, they all came from, um, well, they all looked up to Jack, and they were all proud of being part of, of working together, and it was like a family. So. So I set off, and I think there were about 22 or 26 of us. We had a baby, because I think Jenna Cole had just had a baby. We had to take the baby, of course. And, <laughs> and, uh, and we had these two grandmas, Jack's sisters, who had never been on an aeroplane, let alone outside of Perth. And we got to, um, we, and of course, we were going to Canada, to, to Vancouver. And we got to Los Angeles and we had to change planes, but we didn't have any um, visas because I didn't think you had to have visas if you were just changing planes. <laughs> so we had to go through customs. Richard Wally, who had been working with orchestras all over the world, marched ahead and walked through. The rest of us tentatively walked through customs. And would you believe, they confiscated the didgeridoos. They said they're guided missiles. <laughs> <laughs> and they put us in a room. They said you have to stay there and not move until you catch your next connection. Well, of course, everyone wanted a cigarette, so everyone was sneaking out of the room and get going outside to have a fag. But anyway, we got there. And what was so wonderful is that we had sent pictures of, because it was a semi-promenade production, the, the audience for No Sugar moved with the action. And the Canadians had done us proud. They'd found us a, a basketball court, an ice hockey rink that was off-site. And, and they had completely dressed the entire thing. They'd covered it with sand. And they'd used a film designer who had been used to films, had put in all the detail of every little thing. When you look, when you look at the pictures, <laughs> <laughs> these are some of the people from, um, there's Jack and Ernie in The Dreamers. Um, there's Jack. 
this is this I think is still the dream. Yes. And here this is oh sorry, I don't know how to go back. There's there's no sugar at the at the World Theatre Festival and there's Jedda Cole and and in a minute oh, there's Jedda and there's Ben Gabriel with her. Um, there's Lynette Narkel. There's John Moore. So well, what I was saying was that this film designer had, had taken note of everything that we had sent him and he put the miniature bottles and everything was set up. It was the most incredible set and the audience loved it because here was a show that, you know, the, as the action moved from place to place, the audience all moved across the sand with them. And what always made me laugh was that um, the Canadian Indians, who at that time were living in reserves, um, my cast would open the back door and let them all in so that they could come and see the show. Mm -hmm. So there were Canadians and there were Inuits. And, and the Canadians all said, gosh, Australia must be a fantastic place that they've chosen this play to come and represent them. <laughs> we laughed. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a wonderful experience and Andrew and I tried to put, put, it, uh, put it on in New South Wales, um, but we could never find uh, a space big enough because after having had that wonderful expanse, we wanted it to have the same sort of feeling of the promenade production. But I've got to say that some years later, um, Neil Armfield did a, a, a very good uh, production of it at the Belvoir Street Theatre. But we, in 1988, we remounted No Sugar and it was presented in London at the Riverside Studios as part of the Australian Bicentennial. So uh, that was, a, again, a really exciting time for us all to, to actually get to London and to, to be representatives of Australia. And meantime, uh, Honey Spot, which was the show that Jack had written for children, it had its world premiere in 1985 at the Come Out Festival in, in Adelaide and then it toured to Melbourne. And in 1986, it did a Victorian tour with the Victorian Arts Council. And then it came to Belvoir Street in association with Tow Truck. And I, I want you to just listen, as I say, in association with, because the whole of these years have been made possible by the collaboration of other companies and other people, and people taking a risk because it, it was, a, a, you know, they sometimes hadn't seen the show, they, they just cared very much to, to be able to put it on. And so it then represented Australia at the Edinburgh Festival, Tony Spot did, before touring to the Third Eye Centre in Glasgow. And in 88, it did a USA and Canadian tour because it went to international children's festivals. It went to Seattle, Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Winnipeg, Regina, and then it rehearsed again in Sydney before going to Brisbane for Expo. I've got to say though, Richard Tullett directed Honey Spot, and, and I also want to say that just recently I uh, received an invitation to see Honey Spot at uh, Yuriyaka, and I thought, oh, you know when you've been involved with something years before you think, oh, it's past its time, I'm not sure I want to go again. It was the most delightful production. It was Carl Morrison did it and I just loved it because it was so fresh. Lynette Narkel was in it, would you believe, still? Um, but it was so fresh and it, it was relevant to the, uh, to the young audiences and it it was so terrific to see something after, well, we're talking about 20 years or so. 
1991, I'd taken it to, um, to, to I'd put it on in Sydney for two weeks, and it was invited to the Scottish International Children's Festival, and it had toured to Glasgow, Edinburgh, Inverness, and Derry in Northern Ireland. So, so just from Andrew Ross bringing me up, or originally I rang him, and saying, you know, Wendy, we've, we've got to, we've got to do something. We've got to this. I was able to commission those works, and 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 you can, as you can see from what I've just read out, that they had, you know, really, really good seasons all over the world. So there they are. We obviously got the didgeridoo across the time. <laughs> oh, that's right, because after that, I got a special document saying that this was a, a traditional musical instrument and that the customs should jolly well <laughs> leave their hands off. <laughs> There's Maureen Watson with Shane McDowell. <coughs> So Andrew, uh, still bullying me, said there's the third part of the trilogy. <laughs> and so we, we um, he wrote, or, or Jack wrote, Barungan, which was the third part. But I, I've got to say that Andrew by that time had left Western Australia and Andrew had worked very much as a dramaturg with Jack. And I never felt that the third part was as exciting as the first two because it, it, um, it, it was depressing in some ways. It, it did a tour. It was, by then it was called the Marley Beal Company and it toured to Perth and Adelaide and Alice Springs and the Brisbane Expo and Townsville. Um, but the MTC wanted to put it on, they wanted to put it on the, the, th the whole trilogy and, and that was called The First Born and that's the poster of The First Born. I've got a poster here of Barungan and I've got, look, there's Jimmy Pike who did the design for it. Uh, and and the, 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 the trilogy of plays was wonderful and it was because the Melbourne Theatre Company had the money to mount the whole trilogy that, that I was actually able to to take the um, to take the no sugar to the to the bicentennial celebrations in London. So again, it was collaboration with lots of different people. I've got to say that somewhere in the middle of all of that, um, there was a, a play uh, Aboriginal playwriting festival in Canberra. And uh, I think Brian Siren was very involved with, with uh, working on that. And the, um, there was a gentleman who came from the Long Wharf Theatre in New Haven, Connecticut, because he had decided that he was going to do a world, a year of world theatre, and he wanted to do Bully's House, a play by Tom Keneally. Well, I can remember driving him to Canberra, and of course he'd, he'd he didn't know any Aboriginal artists. And he said, oh, I can't do this. He said, you cast it. And he went back to America. So I cast Ernie Dingo in the lead, Tommy Lewis in the second lead, Paul Pryor was in it, Justin Saunders was in it, Richard Wally went. But I suddenly realised what we've been talking about in the last few days. I never wanted to ever again do an Aboriginal story written by a white person. I, it, and many have come to me, but I have never done any again because there was, they didn't understand uh, all the things that they should have understood. And Bully's, uh, Bully's house did a return season when it came back to Australia and we suddenly went to Queensland and we suddenly found that there were totems in that play that should not have been cited by women, correct me if I'm wrong, um, and that, that the, the cast 
got quite sick in Queensland because they, they felt vibes of that or repercussions from, from the local people. And I think that's what we've been talking about. And I just mentioned that because I not only did Tommy Lewis, he just finished the chant of Jimmy Blacksmith and he was furious because he didn't get the lead. Um, so it wasn't a really very happy time. And, and, I, I, and they, instead of using um, white Australians in the white parts, they used Americans. So I never saw the production overseas, but uh, I think uh, I was lucky to miss it. Um, <laughs> so, so, Jack's shows. And so I decided that I would stop um, producing and touring Aboriginal work because I felt the time had come for you to all be doing it yourselves. And, and this was only part of my program. I mean, I was running, I was by now <coughs> running a company that had moved on from the Elizabethan Theatre Trust and it was all about new work from all over the country, not just Aboriginal work. So there was a, but there was a hiatus, there was nothing to fill the gap, there was, and so suddenly I was asked, I think again by Andrew, um, he was, he directed Jimmy Chai's Brand New Day. And he said, you've got to get it over to the other side, Wendy. And so I, I sold it to Queensland and then to the Sydney Festival. Well, what, oh, I always think this is interesting. I looked at the poster when they came to Queensland to do this season, and it didn't mention Aboriginal. It was an Aboriginal musical, but there, were, there was no Aboriginal on. I said, they said, oh no, we think people will stay away if you put that on. I, I couldn't believe it. Anyway, it came to do the Sydney Festival, and it did, uh, it did, I think, a week at Parramatta. I think it did three weeks at Parramatta, actually. And then it came into Sydney, and it did three weeks at the York Theatre at the Seymour Centre. And people loved it, and of course you all know why. It was a, a, a lovely, you know, friendly um, musical. So, somehow, I then found I was doing Sister Girl which was by Sally Morgan. And um, this was the first play that, I'm not sure if it's the only play that Sally Morgan e ever wrote. But um, she is, for those who don't know, was had, at that time, she was the, uh, had a best-selling novel called My Place. And Sister Girl was a sort of mix of bawdy humour and drama. And it focused on two elderly ladies. Um, and Sally's brother, David Milroy, wrote the music for it. And I, I, um, Jack Charles was in it. And I'm sure he won't mind me here, but he tells this story himself, so he won't mind my repeating it. But at that particular time, he was very, quite heavily into alcohol and drugs. And um, we had trouble keeping tabs on him to make sure he got you know, to the performances. But evidently going home one night, he, um, he was um, met by two people who said, oh, hello, Jack. Oh, said Jack, how do you know me? Oh, they said, well, um, we, we've just been to see you at Sister Girl, but, but didn't you know you tried to burgle our house last week? <laughs> <laughs> and he tells that story. <laughs> <and> he, <laughs> So I'm only repeating it because I'm sure he wouldn't mind. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm going to see him on Saturday in Jack Charles versus the Crown, which I've so already seen. I'm going down to Wollongong. We, we are mates. So um, another production that we uh, that I did or was involved with uh, was Binjara Pinjara, and that was devised and performed by Kelton Pell and Trevor Parfitt and Jeff Kelso and Phil Thompson. And, and this was the, um, it's about the uh, first recorded um, massacre of Indigenous people in Western Australia at Pinjara. And um, we, 
we wanted to take it um, to the people in the Northern Territory. So this was the first time that I uh, toured into any of those areas, but we went to um, a, a festival at Belvoir Street downstairs and it went to Adelaide, Mount Gambier, and then Port Pirie, Port Augusta, Alice Springs, Hermansburg, Tennant Creek, and Ali Karang. And then later, in 1997, it went to the Parramatta Riverside, um, to the Festival of the Dreaming, and then to Brisbane, Cherbourg, Ipswich, Cairns, and Townsville. So they all manage, I mean, that's what I was there for to set up tours, to, to make things happen. But it's interesting, and I'd forgotten myself till I looked back, how many different places they went to. And it wasn't easy, I can tell you. Sometimes it was quite hard to get people there, and, and, and sometimes quite hard. Even the everyday things like when they'd go to the ATM and their money wasn't there, and, and you know, they're in the middle of nowhere. It's really, really hard. So somehow I'm in Brisbane and, and somebody says, oh, there's a show on at the Metro, which was a little 90 seat, 90 seat, I think it was 90 seat theatre. And it's the seven stages of grieving. You should go, there's a school performance on if you could nick in with them. And again, it was like the children that I'd sat with when I'd seen the dreams. All these young people immediately, it was lovely being with young people's audiences because they responded. They understood exactly what was happening. They're so intelligent. The word it goes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the, the seven stages of grieving parallels the seven phases of Aboriginal history and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's the seven, the five stages of dying. And I'd known about Deborah Mailman. I'd seen her at the Watt in a Shakespeare. And then I'd seen her in a school's play and I'd liked very much her, her work, but I couldn't somehow, I couldn't organise to get her out of, out of um, Brisbane. But I saw this and it, it was already booked to go to a, um, a, an Ambunda festival at Belvoir and an X-Wave festival in Melbourne. So I, correct me if I'm wrong, Wesley, um, Wesley and Deborah had written it together, Wesley had directed it, and, and Deborah was the star of, of the show. And so I set off from the top of Australia to go to all the art centres all down the side of Western Australia to tell them that they should put this show on. People thought I was mad. They said, are you driving by yourself? And I said, yes. So I went to Derby, Broome, Port Hedland. Um, I went, you know, whatever, right down until I got to... And, and the, the tour was set up. And, and that's what it did. And it went across uh, to uh, Groburn and Carnarvon and Perth. And then it got to Hobart, and it was just the beginning uh, of um, uh, the, the time when we were starting to have an Australian theatre festival. So I think we're in about 96 now. Um, and so I, I broke the tour in Tasman, in, after Hobart and got the show to, the, to Canberra, where the, the theatre festival was on. Which, and then uh, it was shown there, and and then it went back and finished, you know, the Tasmanian tour with Lord Seston and Alveston. So, would you believe, in 1997, it went to the space in Adelaide, to the London International Festival of Theatre, and later, as we'll get to, it went to the 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 play. <laughs> it went to the Playhouse um, at the Sydney Opera House as part of women's business. See, there's Brand New Day. See, there's John Moore. Lovely. There's Sister Girl. And here's the seven stages of grieving. 
And uh, I, I love the story about the ice block, because at one place they forgot to turn the, the, the uh, ice machine on and it all melted. <laughs> and uh, and <laughs> here's, here's uh, Pinjara Pinjara, which of course is now, they're, they're getting up again, though it's a, a, a new version. And there's women's business. Um, uh, Rhoda Roberts was doing the first um, uh, Olympic festival, the festival of the dream, and she asked me if I would produce um, women's business, and these were to be one woman, one women woman shows, one from Canada, one from New Zealand, Ningali Lawford doing her wonderful production of Windmill Baby, and. Um, uh, Deborah was to come across, she was going to be doing a show uh, uh, at, um, uh, I think the Sydney Theatre Company, a, a Shakespeare, but she could come across and do a matinee of Seven Stages of Grieving, and I was to produce from scratch the White Baptist Aberfan from Deborah Cheatham and Box the Pony from Leah Purcell. So, so that was good, it was like presenting some that were already made, but starting from scratch with two new shows. And of course, um, White Baby Sabbath Band was written and performed by Deborah, but directed by Kathy Downs, who's a very well-known New Zealand actor, director. And, um, and Box the Pony, we chose Scott Rankin to, to write it, and he then had co-writing um, credits with Deborah herself, uh, and it was directed by Sean Mee, who was then, uh, at that time, running La Um They were very, very successful, and um, so they showcased, were Deborah um, showcased her, her show at the Arts Market in Adelaide, and she then went on to the Queer Up North Festival in Manchester in the UK, to the Brisbane Festival, the Canberra Theatre Centre, the Melbourne Festival and the Feast Festival in Adelaide. In, um, in 99, she went to Christchurch, Auckland and Zurich. And it was lovely to see her yesterday. She, she was here just for the day and she came to tell me about her opera company which she's running um, her Aboriginal opera company, which she's running in Melbourne, but, uh, but spoke very kindly of the opportunity of actually getting that show up and having, having the chance to take it to all those different places. And Box the Pony, as I'm sure you all know, um, uh, Leah Purcell uh, had her first season in women's business and went to um, a festival of contemporary arts in, Can in Canberra. She went to the Adelaide Festival, um, she went to the Melbourne Festival, she went to the Perth, uh, Perth in 99 and I took her to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and then in 2000 the Barbican in London asked to put them on as a double bill which they did very successfully. So that was terrific outcomes. Now what have I been doing since then? <laughs> uh, in 2009, Performing Lines, uh, Harley Stum uh, produced it. it. He produced Burning Daylight, for, which was the Marigeku's production out of Broome. And uh, that did a, a, a successful tour. But suddenly I got a call from Nigel Jamison. And I'd worked with Nigel Jamison many years before on a, um, a puppet show with Indonesians, a puppet music show called The Theft of Sita, which had been very successful. And he said, I've, I worked with the Chucky Dancers uh, at, at the opening of the Sydney Festival uh, this year, Wendy, and I'd like to do a show with them. So we, we want to go to Elko Island and, and, and work with them. Well, I mean, Elko Island, I don't know if any of you have been there, but it's a long way away. And it's quite uh, difficult for people because they haven't got any full-time work and it's very expensive. 
and it's very limited in resources. Anyway, to cut a long story short, we gathered a team together and we gathered the Chucky dancers um, and Nigel worked with them and in two thousand luckily in two thousand and ten Paul Grabowski was running the Adelaide Festival and he and Nigel were great mates because they both worked on the theft of CETA as well as many other things. And so somehow we got the tour up to go to the Adelaide Festival followed by the Malt House in Melbourne and then the Darwin Festival and the Sydney Opera House. Now these tricky dancers um, with Jakapura and, and other elders. The Chukis are, are very good musicians, but had only ever done 10 or 15 minute or 20 minutes at the most slots. They'd never done six or seven shows a week in a 90 minute show. It was a big ask. And so we brought them down from limited resources on Elko. We brought them to Bugnina and we worked there for, I think, a month before we got them to the Adelaide Festival. And what was really so wonderful uh, about that, um, you know, there were a lot of hiccups, in, but, but because they weren't used, as I've said, to, to doing show after show after show, um, but by the time we, 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 we broke after the Malt House and sent them back to Elko and got them back again for Darwin and, and the Sydney Opera House, and it was fantastic to see that the, the further rehearsal, the further discipline, the, that knowing exactly what they were doing, it, the show was wonderful. And it had uh, Railway Hick in it, who is, is doing terrific work. It had some, you know, really, really good, um, exciting things. And Josh, uh, I think, I don't know whether Josh is here, but Josh has been working with the Chookies and hopefully they'll be touring some more because, and it, what it did was, it gave them something to look forward to. It gave them something important to, as well as the fact they were being paid every week and uh, all those things that are so important if, you're, if your resources are very limited. So that was a, a, a terrific experience. Um, and since then, I don't know, somebody conned me into um, <laughs> doing a show called I Am Eora for the Sydney <laughs> Festival. I actually retired. I am retired. I want you to all know I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, the Opera House very, very graciously gave me, oh, gave me a, um, uh, they gave me a, a farewell party, which was really nice of them. And people came out of the woodwork and said, bar oh, things. And, but, but at least made us laugh. And, but the thing was that I went back to work the next day so that I could do I Am Yura. And of course that was, and that was Wesley's show. And, and he will um, talk to you about it because Again, I learned so much because the politics were quite difficult because the people in New South Wales are divided about who was there first or, you know, I'm, I'm simplifying it, but, but they're divided almost into two areas of, of, of who was actually living on what area of land at such time and therefore have ownership of stories and but it, it was Wesley's version of I haven't got any pictures of it um, I'm afraid but it was Wesley's version of of the Pebble Way, Barangaroo and Venalong story is that a simple way of, and but telling it in music and and um, and song. So uh, since then, uh, in my retirement, I have been uh, I've been helping Mugulan produce the Yellow Monday um, Playwriting Festival, and um, it ties up 
this history. Um, it ties up this history because it's so long. It was 20, approximately 20 years since there'd been an Aboriginal playwriting, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, excuse me, playwriting festival in 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 Sydney, and it had come out of the festival in in um, a forum in Cairns where it, which had been agreed that it was important to to be able to have the real real stories and encourage the writers. And I think there were 17 or 18 um, plays that came in for the festival, uh, and there were six chosen. Um, interestingly enough, three from WA and one from um, Melbourne, and, and, uh, and two, I think, from, from Sydney. But what came out of the forum, and I'm just going to read this to you, it, people felt that it was an exchange of cultural experiences and our tradition of storytelling, culturally appropriate and sensitive dialogue, sharing stories and experiences from other nations or country, exploring indigenous process our own way of developing concepts, seeing and hearing the diversity of our stories and creating authenticity in the narrative and stories presented and defying stereotypical portrayals of our stories. And I read that to you because I felt that we've been talking quite a lot about that in the last few days and I it was really wonderful to have, we ended up, I think, with about 20 or 22 actors, um, dramaturgs, directors, working on this festival. And it, it I mean, I saw so much talent. The, the 22 Aboriginal actors, many of whom I had never seen before or knew about, and they were so talented and there waiting to tell the stories that belong to them. And it was a terrific experience. And so I, I just finish what I've been, uh, the slice of history I've been giving you with, with that thought that this must continue. This playwright, this support for the playwrights must continue. We're hoping that Mugland will be able to to do um, fest more festivals, more playwriting festivals, and and that that by that we can build on. Um, I think that two of the plays that were workshopped during this when I call it a festival, it was really a workshop. There were just readings at the end, but two of the plays that were read are already being talked about as having productions, and so it's it's a stepping stone.